Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the first guy to funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon, pick one up. We'll be glad you did. As always, whether you're watching or listening, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support. And if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe. Subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and never miss out anything related to truth and rhythm or anything else related to Funk and Stuff. Tell a friend, tell family, we need that support. Appreciate it. This episode features co-founder, horns player, composer, and producer Carl Vickers and guitarist, composer, arranger John McGee from one of the finest and most popular soul funk bands of the 1970s and 1980s that is love togetherness and devotion better known as ltd founded as love men limited in 1968 just about an hour north of me in greensboro north carolina the core band would later solidify its lineup with additional members including future singing superstar jeffrey osborne and his brother billy osborne changing the name to ltd the group signed to AM Records and released its self titled debut album in 1974. And later that year, its follow up called Getting Down. Although both came and went relatively quietly in terms of sales and radio play, the latter set the tone for what was to come with choice funk tracks like Don't Lose Your Cool and El Dorado Joe. Switching producers, getting more outside songwriting help, and having McGee join the group. LTD broke out in 1976 as one of the period's premier R&B bands with the Love to the World album that contained the smash crossover hit Love Ballad. Here, the band's bold orchestral and gospel-infused sound coalesced to take the listener on an oral journey full of varied tones and tempos. The record ushered in a string of five consecutive top R&B albums. The others were Something to Love, Togetherness, Devotion, and Shine On. Highlights and hit tracks during that run included Age of the Showdown, Back in Love Again, We Party Hardy, Never Get Enough of Your Love, Material Things, Holding On, We Both Deserve Each Other's Love, Jam, Concentrate on You, You Fooled Me, Together Forever, One on One, Stand Up LTD, Dancing, Singing, Stranger, where Did Our Love Go Wrong, Get Away, and Shine On. During that golden period, LTD rivaled contemporaries like Earthman and Fire and the Commodores. But it was not to last as Jeffrey Osborne left to pursue a very successful solo career. The group soldiered on with a final album for A&M in 1981 called Love Magic. And actually that record did respectably well, included a top 10 R&B dance cut and kicking back. Unfortunately, LTD had lost its unique vocal identity, and by the time of its final studio album, For You, in 1983, it had adopted the synth-driven funk sound of that era, and while competent, the group lacked a distinctive stamp in its sound by that point. McGee had left prior to that last album, and both he and Vickers went on to work on myriad projects in the ensuing years. In this in-depth interview, Vickers and McGee Talk about how LTD was formed, the many things that made the band original and special, the recording sessions, songs, and albums, amazing tales from the road, parting ways with Jeffrey Osborne, believing in the magical power of music, what they're up to today, and many other insights and stories to boot. I have sought to get LTD on this show, to get their story on truth and rhythm for some time, so this is another one of those especially gratifying additions for me. But then also spending time with these gentlemen and learning firsthand how genuine they are with sweet icing on an already musically delicious cake. So with that, it's time to fall back in love all over again with love, togetherness, and devotion. I'm so pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership LTD founder and horns player Carl Vickers and guitarist, composer, arranger John McGee. The pair were major contributors throughout the 1970s into the 1980s 
Building Love, Togetherness, and Devotion, better known as LTD, into one of the all-time great R&B funk bands. Gentlemen, welcome. So glad to have you with me today. Thank you for having us. So the viewers know right now John is made on camera. That's John. Say hello <laughs> to the people, John. <laughs> I, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Glad to be here. And there's Carl. Thank you, Scott, for the kind words. <laughs> Most welcome. So, uh, Carl, where are you coming to us from today? I'm coming from West Palm Beach, Florida. Okay. And that's been, uh, what, what, what do you call home? Where do you call home? Uh, I've actually lived all around the country. I was born in Portland, Oregon, but I call West Palm Beach my home because this is where I grew up and went to high school. Mm -hmm. And John, what about you? Where do you hail from and where are you now? I hail from the great city of Chicago, but I currently live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Ah, cold. It gets cold there. Both <laughs> places, yes. <laughs> That's quite a different climate from Carl. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, I've been looking very much forward to uh, getting the LTD story on here. So I'm excited and I'm real glad to, to have you both on. I must share with you, um, you know, all the way back in my high school days, going back, uh, dating me. But, you know, I was a DJ back then doing a lot of house parties and a lot of dances and things like that. And also going to, you know, so many house parties with the packed, sweaty house parties. And LTD was just such a staple of those parties for both, you know, the up-tempo jams and also the slow ballads, all of it. You know, just such great memories. So thank you for that. Thank you for being such a fan. Absolutely. All right. So let's jump in and find out a little bit about you know, how you first got into music. And then we'll work our way up to, to LTD. So... Let's talk about, uh, Carl, how did you first get into music? Uh, did you come from a musical family? Did you have formal training? I did. I was literally born into a musical family. Um, my father, although became a, a doctor of dental surgery, was an alto player and played on the Erskine Hawkins band back in the 30s. Um, and uh, he played alto. And uh, his stepmother, who I consider my grandmother, was a piano and voice teacher. So she wow. started me on piano at uh, four years old. Wow. And, and, and at what point did you start playing in your first groups and, and bands and so forth? Well, um, that led, I hated the piano, let's say, at first. And uh, I went to her and begged her to let me play the trumpet which um, was part of an instrumental experimental program when I was in the fifth grade. She acquiesced and I started playing the trumpet and then I literally fell in love with the trumpet. And of course went through high school playing in bands and um, eventually going to college, but I went to college to be a doctor. Um, but one semester I took trumpet as an elective and that was the beginning of my new life. Uh, the trumpet instructor said I was a very good player, good reader, and if I didn't mind, I could be in the pit band at the Howard Theater. And that's in Washington, D.C., where I was in college. So I did get that job. And that was the beginning of, of my history, where I met the Temps, the Miracles, and eventually Sam and Dave, who I went on the road with. But I literally got to play with all the R&B groups uh, from the 60s. And uh, that was my beginning uh, also sitting beside the guys that were on the road with Basie and Ellington. So that was my education and uh, beginning of my professional career. Well, how did your family feel about you pursuing music instead of the doctor? Uh, they did not take that lightly. Uh, my father was <laughs> actually thrilled because he now began to um, vicariously live his life through me. And once we became hit, then all, it, all was paradise for him. But, of course, my grandmother and my mother always thought that I should stay with something more stable. But as life would have it, once I started sending gold and platinum records, now I'm the hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, success has a way of changing minds. That's true. John, what about you? How did you first get into music, and how did you gravitate towards the guitar and all that good stuff? Well, 
<clears throat> not unlike Carl, I started out uh, uh, taking piano lessons at a very early age. However, I was, I guess you could consider me a little lazy because I had, a, I've been blessed with a great ear. And the piano teacher always knew that my lessons I was memorizing as opposed to reading. So I used to get my knuckles slapped quite a bit. And then I fell in love with, I fell in love with the guitar. So uh, I begged and begged until my parents finally got me one. And uh, from there, I was pretty much, like I said, I was blessed with a great ear. So I was pretty much self-taught. And then later on, I took some or I attempted to take some formal lessons that didn't work out too well. And at a very early age, I don't know if you remember a group called the Five Stair Steps, but they were famous for one song in particular called Ooh Child. Mm -hmm. And I got to go on the road with them uh, at a very early age. And my 13th birthday, I found myself on the stage of the Apollo Theater with them. And uh, I was amazed. I, I was just truly blown away. Then I started playing with all the Chicago uh, local, well, not locals, but the Chicago uh, big boys. And uh, from there, it just went on and on and on. And then I eventually moved out to the West Coast, where Mr. Verdeen White of Earth, Wind & Fire got me my first session work in L.A. And uh, it went on from there. And then I finally hooked up with LTD. Excellent. Thank you, John. So, uh, Carl, um, how did LTD come together and what role did you play in that? Okay, I gave you a lot of the earlier prehistory. The actual history starts with the Sam and Dave band. Uh, after a couple of years touring with them, we had a great band, uh, which was an act in and of itself. And in that band was a wonderful horn section. And I remember, I think it was, we played Auburn University. We were sitting on the bleachers after the sound check. And the band leader said, guys, this is great, but we can do our own thing. We can form our own group. And he asked for defectors. Well, as much fun as we were having and success as we were having with Sam and Dave, we had this vision as well of forming our own group. So five horn players and the band leader, which was the bass player, defected from Sam and Dave and literally formed LTD. It wasn't called LTD at first. It was called uh, Love Men Limited, so, which was Love Men LTD. And eventually we forgot the Love Men and we made something out of the LTD. And do you remember what was your first or close to first performance as that entity? Well, we moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, where the bass player had a house. He and the tenor player shared a house there. So we all moved into that house and literally lived together, creating music. We put a rhythm section around the horn section, and we chose the best people we could have ever chosen. We chose the drummer from the Charlie Mingus group, who was Danny Richmond, and we chose James Davis, who was a local genius and became the core of LTD, its arrangements, its music. And he was literally the grandfather of LTD. And we, we built that group around his expertise and his musical genius. Um, and we lived together. We rehearsed eight hours a day. We went through all that. And we played all the clubs up and down the East Coast, starting with uh, clubs around uh, North Carolina and, uh, and Greensboro and eventually getting an agent and going up and down from New York to Florida. We would do all the club circuit things. And then, of course, that would take us to New England. We had clients up there that would bring us up two or three times a year. And we got on the circuit. One of the gigs happened to be Lloyd Price's turntable, which took us to New York. And we actually followed Cool in the Gang and Lloyd Price's turntable um, as our first kind of decent gig in New York and eventually we moved to New York to try to get the record deal and we worked the whole circuit up there but the winter came in and there was a gig in Philadelphia we couldn't make one year and we decided hey man let's we got to go where there's no weather <laughs> and we had a friend in Los Angeles working at Warner Brothers that uh, gave us a call and said you guys need to come out here the pickings are great come on out I'll hook you up 
of course, it was a slow move of getting us hooked up. But three years after we moved out in 1970, we got the deal in 73 with A&M Records. So in those early stages, what other groups or influences were you guys kind of following? What, what, what inspired the group in terms of its early sound? Um, and, and who were, you know, some of those that you looked up to? I think that could be told by the medleys that we would put together. We would put together, we had a Sly medley. These were our favorite groups. We had a Temptations medley. Um, we loved the jazz uh, rock groups of the era, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Chicago, uh, Ten Wheel Drive, uh, In Cold, uh, Cold Blood. All of those groups from the 60s that had been jazz oriented were our influences where we could because we could see the marriage of rhythm and blues or jazz and rock into a fusion and uh, that was the direction of our music we were all aspiring some of us were aspiring beboppers but we uh, turned out to be commercial players uh, to make money and um, and we would uh, creatively put these medleys together. We had that, that Sly medley. In fact, that was probably the seminal medley we had because we were playing with Mary Clayton. I don't know if you know the name, but she sang on Game of oh, yeah. Shelter with Rolling Stones. Uh, and we were, we were her backup band. And uh, she took us to the Monterey Pop Festival, which was starring, I think, Chris Christophs and Joan Baez that year. And Mary was supposed to come on, but they had some kind of technical difficulty. So they came to the band. They said, LTD, could you go and play a song for us? We need about 10 minutes. We said, you bet. So we played our slide medley and we turned that 100,000 people. We turned it out. And a and Records and um, uh, what was, uh, it was a subsidiary actually that she was signed to. And uh, they were interested in us and then A&M became uh, interested, and then we had Jerry Butler in our back pocket, who had a deal at A and M. He had a production deal, so he brought us in with that deal, and eventually sold us to A and M. The deal for him didn't work out, but they loved the band, and they kept us. Now, originally, uh, Jeff Osborne was not the lead singer, um, but by the time you started recording, he basically moved into that role. Can you just uh, walk us through? you know, the, the vocal history and the early going? Okay, the early going, we had, we literally had a female singer as a lead singer, James Davis. The keyboardist was also uh, a main lead singer. And the bass player sang just like Otis Redding. So in the very beginning, he was the main lead singer, but then he got involved in drugs and wanted to sign a contract with a drug dealer. And we said, uh, no thanks, we're out. So that was the end of our relationship with him. And we went on with the lead singer, James Davis. And actually, each of the horn players would lead a song. So you can imagine how sad this group was at this time. Uh, but we kept working. And we were in Rhode Island uh, working at a club where the drummer happened to be, uh, <laughs> de let's say, detained for a second. It was the last set. We had no drummer. <laughs> and a guy says, you know, there's a drummer sitting in the audience. His name is Jeffrey Osborne. And if he plays, he loves you guys' group. And if he plays, ask him to sing because he's a really good singer. So Jeffrey came and played, and uh, the rest was history. He was so natural and so talented. And, of course, we asked him to sing. And he sang a Lou Rawls song, Love is a Hurting Thing. We never played with Jeff, but you would swear we'd rehearse with him for years because he set up all the horn licks. He just felt where the music was and, and was naturally a great mix, um, matchup. So that was the beginning. But little did he know, we had decided already to go to California. So he said, well, after New Year's, I can commit to the group. And we had a New Year's gig in Newport, Rhode Island. He met us there and said, I'm ready to go. And said, okay, we're headed back to New York. But little did he know, we were only headed there to lock that apartment, grab our stuff, and head to California. So that was kind of his initiation. And being the new guy, <laughs> we made him drive most of the way. <laughs> uh, that was the beginning of, of Jeffrey. And it was uh, sort of a, 
a heavenly match because his voice was so incredible and his musicianship was very natural and it was just the perfect thing for the group. And, uh, and then we got to California where his brother lived, who was the, uh, he was the uh, MD for the Friends of Distinction. And that's where the rest of our rhythm section came from. The bass player, Henry Davis, the other keyboardist, uh, Billy Osborne, were, were members of the Friends of Distinction, and they eventually joined our group. So just to get the timeline straight, did you already have the a and deal before they joined, or did that come after they joined? No, that came after. We had, Billy had the Jerry Butler connection, because of Friends of Distinction, some kind of way that was a connection. And when he heard the group, he just was very excited about the new group that Billy had. And uh, eventually that led us to a and But that would have been in 1970, and we didn't get the deal until May of 73. So we uh, messed around, you know, um, doing gigs around L.A. We went to Japan for a couple of months and did, there was a club there where all R&B groups that hadn't made it yet would go call the Mugen. And that was instrumental in us really tightening our show up and, and, and making the group tight. And we already had uh, original material, which we were recording. Uh, but again, you know, I t as I explained to you, the first record only sold to our friends and neighbors. The second sold to a few more. And it was a third in 76 that actually hit. Yeah, yeah. So Wow, some uh, fantastic, uh, fascinating history there. Thanks uh, for that, Carl. Um, so yeah, that first record, 74, was the self-titled Love Together, uh, Love Togetherness and Devotion. Um, didn't make much of a ripple, like you said. Uh, but one track success, um, I think, was a pretty funky soul track. And, um, and, and the ballad, Thank You, Mother, was a nice uh, Jeffrey uh, sung uh, ballad that I think maybe kind of at least hinted at what might come next. Um, it was very forward looking. And, and you know, uh, musically speaking, I think it may be still our favorite album because it was so honest, you know, and it was literally our soul. It was the music that we had created and worked on for years and it was almost overly worked, um, you know, but it put us in the, in the position that people could see the facility uh, sophistication and the dedication of the musicians in the group. And early on, who was who was producing? Uh, uh, his name was um, Carter, and he was from he was in the um, Jerry Butler stable. Um, Jerry sent him out to produce us, and uh, but to be honest with you, we literally produced it because we knew our music. He just sat with the engineer and, you know, and kind of guided us. And, and a lot of it was strange for him because we knew the music from the inside out. So we were not aware of the technique of producing music. In fact, this was just after um, eight tracks had come along. So it, it wasn't a lot of uh, technical stuff going on anyway, but um, we did it totally backwards. I mean, we, would, we, we put the rhythm section and horn parts down, and then we decided to put on some background vocals, and then we did the lead vocal, which is totally backwards the way you produce records now. You know, you do a, a rhythm section, then you put your scratch vocals, and you build everything around that, and you perfect it around that. But we were self-contained. We knew what the music was. We knew how to perform it. So we didn't need any instruction in that. And uh, so we sort of produced our first two albums, and I would say that is the biggest reason they didn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that second album, though, Getting Down, um, which looks like it came out the same year. So you guys didn't waste any time uh, early on. But, um, you know, that one with songs like Don't Lose Your Cool and El Dorado Joe. Um, <laughs> you know, I think you guys really started to, uh, even though it didn't have the, the commercial success, the uh, pieces were definitely falling in place for what was going to come. Um, and uh, what, what do you remember specifically about that record, uh, Carl? Anything jump out at you? It's a fond memory or a funny memory? Or uh, Well, the album cover is very hilarious to begin with. It's these cartoonish uh, depictions of us and 
uh, platform shoes and, and dance moves. So it was obviously um, geared toward the disco market, uh, which was fine. But I'd like to say this, Scott, we were, although funk was our, you know, our name, we were really balladeers. We loved ballads and we loved sophisticated music and music with, with changes. And we, we, our biggest effort was to try to bring this into the commercial realm, you know, music with, with great orchestrations and, and nice changes and beautiful sounds. It's the same as Earth, Wind and & Fire and the Commodores. We were all sort of on the, on the same page with, with that idea. But uh, the funk always kind of showed through, although we didn't consider ourselves totally a funky group, and other funky groups didn't either, as, as far as that goes. <laughs> we were told once by, by the funk master himself when we opened up for them, he stuck his head, that's George Clinton, stuck his head in the dressing room. He said, great job, LTD, but not quite on the one. <laughs> and so what that told us, we had to go back and work on our funk. And of course, uh, I guess the culmination of that would be back in love again. It's funny, John and I were actually talking about that a little bit uh, before we went on air and before you, you joined in. And uh, about that lesson that uh, those guys taught to most of the bands back then. That's correct. <laughs> well, you know who's the master and the, and the, the grandfather of the teacher. It was JB. Yeah. James Brown, I mean, and, and the next in the lineage would have been Sly. Um, and then probably George Clinton comes close after that, if you would have formed a lineage of funk. And then Bootsy. Well, Bootsy, yeah, and then Bootsy, of course. Was El Dorado Joe a real character that you guys knew? What inspired that? <laughs> El Dorado Joe was a song written by Onion Miller, or Abraham Miller, we called him Onion. And Onion had this very um, raw street kind of a personality and, and, and just history. <laughs> so anyway, he acted was like an El Dorado Joe. So it was just a um, figment of his imagination, but it was all the hit cool cats in the town that had the women and, and uh, you know, in the jet set and worked the nightlife. And it was just kind of a, a a composite of those characters. It's interesting you mentioned George Clinton. Uh, in the '80s, he did a track called "Cool Joe," which kind of <laughs> reminded me of maybe think of El Dorado Joe too. So I think well, it's part of that this, same lineage. The cycle um, of life. I, I want to point out one of the ballads you mentioned. The ballads and on that that album, "Trying to Find a Way," it was a real nice Philly soul kind of ballad on that one too. Yes, written by Billy Osborne, who was one of our balladeer writers and an incredible genius musician as well. Played drums and keyboards and, um, by the way, produced uh, Ray Charles and, and worked with him for the last 25 years of his life. Uh, but um, he wrote that song and, and led the song. He sang it. Uh, he only led a few songs, but if you listen to that, you can tell it's not Jeffrey, but it's very soulful. And it's um, almost a Ray Charles approach to that kind of music. But that was written by Billy Osborne. And again, ballads, we loved ballads. So we loved that song and we had to have that on that album. I felt like uh, Don't Lose Your Cool really sort of uh, was a little bit of a template for what would come later with like a Back in Love again. It sort of was. We, we wanted to cover all aspects of music you know the funk the medium uh, tempo songs some instrumentals because we were basically instrumental uh, musicians and uh, so we would try to cover all categories which might not have been the best uh, model uh, you should probably focus on something but we would try to do a little of this a little of that and a little of our funk thing came from that don't lose your cool which morphed into back in love uh which, by the way, wasn't our favorite choice of a tune when it first came to it. <laughs> but uh, it proved its way, and it's our, our divine uh, choice right now. All right. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But right now, I want to bring John more back into the conversation because, uh, John, you came into the picture for LTD uh, right in this area. So 
Uh, tell us how you actually connected with the group and how you became an official member. Well, um, <clears throat> at the time I had moved, I had moved from Chicago with a group, a uh, Chicago-based group called Third Creation. Uh, we signed a deal with Motown, and uh, and in the interim, I was also playing recording sessions. Like I said, Verdine started me on that in L.A., and uh, I wound up hooking up with Henry Davis in the course of doing recording sessions because he was quite the session bassist. And Henry and I gelled together so well. He looked at me one day after one of the recording sessions. He said, hey, man, <laughs> I got a group for you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I said, well, OK, let's talk about it. And uh, it, it just so happened. It's just funny how things worked out, man. It was like divine intervention. Before I could actually meet them, A&M had hired uh, the, the one of the gentlemen that I came out from Chicago with as a producer to produce some demos on LTD. And it just so oh, happened. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And it just so happened that I was primarily doing almost all the work that he, that he got as a producer. Well, at the time LTD didn't have a guitar player and I got called in on the session, man. And it was like, it was like we had been playing together for years and years and years. And it just kind of gelled and went from there. And um, that's uh, that the, the thing that Mark produced did not make it. But shortly after that, um, I forget the producer that came in, but they came in and I called back for the session. And we recorded it. And uh, the rest is history, man. That was the Mizell brothers. Mizell Brothers, exactly. Okay. Who I had gone to college with. I was at Howard wow. University with uh, Fonts and Larry Mizell, who eventually produced Donald Byrd and the Blackbirds and um, Bobby Humphreys, all of that stuff from that, that stable. They ended up producing all of that stuff. And I knew them from Howard University, um, and we ended up working together, them as our producers. Now, what was your first impression of John when he came into the, the picture? Oh, uh, he said it, divine intervention. I mean, there's no other way to describe that. It was, it was unbelievable. I don't think our feet were touching the ground. When we played together, uh, I'm sure we had a big house, and, you know, we would rehearse in that house. And uh, it was a, we had a, it, it looked like a big riverboat, and it had this big kind of, a galley for the living room and, and we would all congregate in there and rehearse and it had bunk beds in the back where we could sleep but we lived there for years and we rehearsed eight hours a day uh seven days a week by the way it was just our our it was our mantra you know and it, it got us so tight in terms of performance and composition that when Ever we played or wherever we went, we uh, people would take notice because you knew that it was it was something special. So, John, did you first uh, perform with the group, or did you first uh, work on recordings with the group? Uh, the first thing I'd ever did with the group was recordings. I had never had the privilege of working on stage with LTD at that time, and uh, uh, shortly after. The third album was recorded. I had moved back to Chicago for a short period of time. By the time the group was ready to go out and start touring and promoting promote that album, they I got a call and I said, "Sure, I'll come back to the West Coast." I think it was winter in Chicago, <laughs> so I had great incentive to get get the heck out of there and go back to the West Coast. And from there, uh, we uh, started touring around, and uh, I never left. Well, so this third record obviously is a, a landmark uh, achievement, not just for LTD, but you know, soul music and, and R&B in general for the 70s. Um, and that was Love to the World, 1976. Had Love Ballad, which was the huge crossover hit that really put the band on the map. Um, and um, you know, that was uh, written by uh, Skip Scarborough, right? Yes, so, correct. Um, when he, he was, was a senior, songwriter was... who wrote a lot of a lot of other hit songs for Earth, Wind, and Fire and many other uh, acts. 
so this album, you know, was was a big shift um, in tone and theme and producers and some of the writing. How did that all come together where it was so much of a change for the third record? I'll handle I'll try to tackle that. After our two non-selling albums, the, the record company came to us and they said, we love you guys. You're a fantastic group. Would you allow us to find a producer for you? And, and we said, um, sure, that would be great. Because they were going to drop the group. We would not have a record deal if, if, you know, if we hadn't taken their suggestion for a producer. Uh, it just so happens they went and got Fonts and Larry Mizell, who I did know from college. And, uh, and it was, again, divine intervention because it was just the perfect marriage of commercialism and group performance that made that happen. They brought material. They brought the love ballad which, by the way, had been turned down by Earth, Wind, and Fire. Skip Scarborough wrote for them, and he, he gave them first right of refusal. Maurice turned it down, and when we heard it, we said, yes, please, because we could hear Jeffrey singing that song. So we, uh, that, that was the song that we built, uh, that they built the uh, recording around. Uh, we called it Love to the World. They got uh, Wade Marcus, who was a Broadway orchestrator to come in um, and they just brought in top technical uh, people and we recorded a very fine record one of our favorites actually to this day absolutely yeah you know I mean that's the record that brought me to the group too um, and then I went back and and heard the earlier ones but um, this record I mean really stood out because it had such a um, I like to uh, say it had a cinematic feel to it, you know, yeah. especially with um, like the way it starts with love to the world. To the it world. feels like it's like a cinematic introduction that you're going on this journey. And there was like a lot of orchestral and gospel and just so many different influences going on on that record. That was the intent. Um, it was very <laughs> programmatic. So a lot of baby making on that record too. <laughs> <laughs> we get that all the time. <laughs> no doubt about that. And, that, and I think continues to this day. Um, <laughs> so many generations. <laughs> so when that thing was uh, completed, you know, how did you feel about it? Did you think, wow, this is gonna be a hit? You know, when you're doing a project, uh, of course, in your mind. It, it sounds like a hit to you because you're doing it and it sounds great. Everything has come together in the right way, but nobody knows what a hit is. Nobody can predict a hit. So, you know, you kind of withhold that enthusiasm, but you know, you have a good product. And of course, I'll never forget. Uh, we went to Washington DC where the record actually broke out. And, of course, this was home for me because I had worked at Howard Theater there. I had gone to Howard University. And we were walking down the street. I think we were so poor, I had to go buy underwear. I remember that. Wow. We were walking down the street to go to the department store. And, you know, the big ghetto blasters were just coming out and guys walking with them on their shoulder. And a guy passed us, man, and our record was on. And that guy, that guy, that guy said, LTD. The best new group of 76. Man, we almost fainted. And we just wanted to go, hey, that's us. That's us. But you know, <laughs> we fainted ourselves because nobody would believe it anyway. I mean, yeah, I was going to buy underwear, you know, and hearing a, a record that was soon to be a, a monster record. Uh, so that was sort of a, a, a omen, I would say, an omen. Wow. That's quite a dichotomy of the two things, kind of the two worlds kind of crossing and then diverging yes um john how did it feel for you to be all of a sudden part of this juggernaut you know this rising great uh successful band well you know at first i don't really even think that i realized what was going on uh i was just so much into the music and playing i mean i just loved playing and um you know I, i've got to divert back to Mr. James Davis. Carl iterated earlier that what a genius he was. I consider James um, 
an integral teacher for me in my musical career and the, the diversity that I developed through James Davis. And um, it, it just, you know, I don't think it hit me until Back in Love came out again, you know, t- until it came out. And um, Carl also mentioned something about nobody knew what a hit record was. And I used to think that until we ran into, um, um, come on, Carl, help me. What's his, what was his name? Our producer. He used uh, to produce. Oh, Bobby from Martin from Bobby Philly Martin from Philly International. Oh, my goodness. That man could hear a hit record like oh, nobody's yeah. business. Well, yes. He had a straight You know, record. and, and, um, it, I remember this story. I think Back in Love had just gone to number one in the country. And we were on tour and we were on our way to Nashville, Tennessee. Well, we got to the hotel that we were supposed to be checked into. And they and they and we got to the desk and they says, well, your reservations have been canceled and uh, your record company remade them over here at this other hotel. Well, at the time, there was a, a hotel in Nashville called the Spence Manor. Wow. which was unlike any other hotel in the country at the time. It was an old apartment building that, that had been turned into a hotel, and each apartment was a hotel room with any type of musical instrument in it you desired. Whatever you played, the whole thing. We had welcome baskets, champagne, you know, the whole nine yards, man. Um, and also copies of Billboard, number uh, LTD was now number one in the country, and it was amazing. It was the first time I've ever felt anything like that, and I don't think I'll ever feel anything like that <laughs> quite again. Not that way, you know. It was the first time, and uh, you, I just you just couldn't beat it. 